All right, guys, uh, we have a special treat for you all today. Uh, we're here with a, an author and friend of Doug Casey, uh, James Kunstler. And uh, I have, since Doug introduced me to, uh, to James earlier this year, I've read two of his books so far. And boy, do they make you think they're extremely well written. And uh, his ideas are a little scary, to be honest. But my goal today is to try and help our, our viewers understand a little bit more about your view of what the narrative about what's actually happening in the world right now, which I know you've talked about a lot in the past, and what it might look like in the future and what you can do about it, essentially. So just uh, how would you summarize your ideas, um, or your body of work, James? Uh, my whole body of work? Because, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it spans a period of, I had, I had my early blue period where I published eight novels. Uh, and because uh, that was the programming for someone with serious liter literary aspirations in the 1970s. And then I went back to journalism uh, and I was writing for the New York Times Magazine. And then I turned one of those books in uh, one of those uh, stories into a book proposal for The Geography of Nowhere, which was my first book about the failures of uh, uh, how we were inhabiting the landscape and how it represented a ecological, economic, uh, spiritual uh, uh, problem for us that was, you know, going to be uh, increasingly a burden on our society. And that, because that led me into the question of uh, how we were going to power that whole system, I became interested in the peak oil situation. And that coincided with a weird thing with the rise of the internet. And a lot of geologists were retiring out of the oil industry and publishing their dark and secret thoughts in the usual journals, the obscure journals of, uh, you know, uh, petroleum and, and uh, mining. But that stuff was making its way to the internet. So all of a sudden, you know, uh, everybody could read about what, what was really going on in the oil industry and what their projections were. And the obvious conclusion you came to was we weren't gonna be able to run our society the way it had been designed to run. Uh, and um, our experiences since then, that was the late 90s, have pretty much proven that. Um, the journey of uh, so-called peak oil has been a little bit strange and full of uh, weird twists and turns. Nobody anticipated the shale oil miracle. But then again, once the shale oil miracle happened in the uh, 2000s, um, nobody anticipated that it was going to crap out so easily. And, and uh, we weren't paying attention to how it really was uh, a creation of the cheap, uh, cheap money, zero interest uh, financial climate. So uh, now that that's happened, it leaves us in a basic pred predicament where uh, we don't have enough uh, oil that is economical enough to get out of the ground. It's not, it's not that there's no cheap oil left at the pump for now, because obviously people are buying gasoline, but it's costing so much to pull the remaining oil out of the ground uh, that uh, it has destroyed the business model for in, uh, a high tech industrial civilization and done it in a very insidious way that so many people are unable to notice, including many, um, or if not most of the most eminent uh, uh, economists in our society. So nobody's paying attention to that. In the meantime, <clears throat> the distortions that are growing out of that problem uh, are tending to drive our society nuts. And we're seeing it being expressed in a lot of uh, truly insane and hysterical political movements. Uh, you know, we're spending all our time uh, arguing over whether Mr. Potato Head should be banned from our culture instead of figuring out how we're gonna, uh, uh, what, what the next business model of the human project is going to be. So I hope that's a concise summary of where I'm at. Well, you, the, the idea that I got from, your, from reading some of your work, and I haven't read obviously all of it, but is that the, our society is uh, very complex and then because it's complexity, it's incredibly fragile. And whether that breaking point is something like, uh, you know, the lack of access to this cheap 
fossil fuels that have that have funded everything so far, or if it's um, uh, you know, climate change related, or if it's just banking related and you know related to the uh, the financial situation in general. That it just the, it's so fragile, it collapse fairly easily. It's all of those things, uh, and um, the reason it is is because what we're talking about is not merely complexity; it's hyper complexity, and it's linked hyper complexity. So that the failures of one system tend to ramify the failures of all the other systems. You know, the, the failures in the energy dynamic that feeds the energy into uh, a society that's geared to producing things of value. When that business model fails, then you're going to see the failure of the financial sector as well. And, and then the, the further attempted workarounds in finance to uh, to repair the stuff that's happening in the other parts of our system uh, tend to create even larger distortions and perversions of reality. And uh, so one of the ways of uh, expressing this, I think, is that increasingly, because reality is so vexing and, and uh, hard for us to understand and make sense of, uh, we've become an, a reality a reality optional society. And that's not a very good place for people to be. You know, the, the final consequence of that is that being uh, living in this reality optional milieu, we're unable to construct a coherent consensus about what has happened to us. And therefore, we can't make a coherent plan to move forward. And we're arguing about Mr. Potato Head and Dr. Seuss. Well, you know, Jim, one of the things you said that I, I liked is the... Uh, is the concept of society not only being com complex, but hyper complex. And it, it's a little bit like that uh, uh, line in Shakespeare, Richard III, I don't know, where he says, uh, for lack of a nail, the horseshoe was lost, for mm -hmm. lack of a horseshoe, the horse, and, and for lack of a horse, the kingdom was lost. And uh, it's pretty much like that today, where everything is so intertwined and interrelated and uh, that something falls apart. You know, on the one hand, people are like cockroaches. I mean, <laughs> if they can survive World War II and things like that and come back, well, okay, fine, everything, everything will work out. But uh, this might be even more serious. Well, I'm serenely convinced that the human project is gonna continue. Uh, and I, and I, I think the key to it is uh, scale. And, and pitch. And uh, I don't think we're going to be able to continue this uh, hyper complex uh, techno industrial orgy uh, that has given us so much comfort and convenience. We're probably going to, you know, kick back to a lower level of, uh, of uh, civilization, if you can call it that. If we, you know, and there's also the, the chance that we're going to enter a very dark age uh, where we lose a tremendous amount of culture, knowledge, and, and practice. Do you, um, do, you remember, do you remember the books that were out? Uh, I first discovered them in the Whole Earth Catalog back in the 70s, I guess. Uh, they were called the Foxfire books. Oh, sure. Yeah, because yeah. the argument, the author, I don't know if you even know the author of that uh, I series. Don't. I, I don't, but his basic thing was, yeah, if things get bad, we're not going to drop back to like the way things were 50 years ago, we're gonna maybe drop back to the way two, things were 200 years ago. So he was looking at like uh, not 19th century, but 18th century technology, as I recall in those books. Could be, that was kind of uh, what I conceived in the four novel series that I wrote uh, under the world made by hand rubric. And by the way, you know, the want for want of the nail, the horse, uh, the horseshoe, blah, blah, blah. Today, it's uh, more like for want of the chip the, uh, you know, the Ford Motor Company can't continue its operations. Yeah, we, we've actually talked about this, uh, the chip shortage recently. And, um, you know, Doug and I originally were like, who cares more? You know, who, we don't really need these computer chips. Like, they, they can't be that important. But you know, as I've thought more about it in the last couple of weeks. In my, I, I bought an RV and I was driving this RV and all of a sudden it started to malfunction. It's brand new. Oh dear! And I was totally disabled on the side of the road. It's I know owning RV is like owning a boat, but totally disabled on the side of the road. And and you know it's got this 
Freightliner chassis. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. However, it, the problem was an intake manifold sensor. Which, oh God. Uh, just some little I, I, tonic yeah. piece totally disables the vehicle. And you know, when you see things like that, you realize, again, the hyper complexity. I mean, this, this diesel engine should be able to do, uh, you know, run a million miles, no problem. And yeah. yet a little sensor kills well, it. So, so imagine, you know, if you, if you take a really major system like, uh, you know, the US energy system and its linkage to the trucking transportation system, you know, and, and the, the linkage between that and getting the food to the supermarkets, it's not a long stretch to see how quickly these systems could uh, cascade, ramify, and, and uh, uh, create problems for each other. So th these are the kinds of things we're looking at. Um, the shale oil industry especially ought to be worrisome to Americans because they had invested so much of their ideas about the future on, on that. And the, the further implications that if we could do shale oil, then naturally there will be all kinds of other miracles that will you know, uh, succeed the shale oil thing. But that whole, whole illusion is now disappearing because uh, shale oil production went down about uh, 2 million barrels a day through the COVID-19 year. And um, it's not bouncing back. And you know, pretty soon we're going to be probably within uh, the next 24 months, we're going to be back in a situation where uh, we have to import a great deal more oil again, if it's even possible to import what we need from the places where we used to import a lot of oil. So that whole situation is fraught, and um, you know, I think we have reason to worry about whether people are going to be able to feed themselves sometime in the fall of 2021. What makes you say that? Well, I think that the, the supply lines uh, from the places that food is grown uh, to the whole supermarket distribution system is extremely fragile. And I think we could see it break down pretty easily. So well, they, if they destroy the dollar in a serious way and yeah. it's unexpected and quick, I mean, uh, that could do it in itself. It doesn't have to be purely physical and mechanical. It could actually happen financial because the world is so highly financialized too. And I noticed today, Doug, that the uh, interest rate on the 10 year bond, uh, you know, we woke up overnight, it's all, all of a sudden over 1.75, I believe, hmm. you know, and just a few days ago it was 1.5 and, and change. And, uh, you know, as that thing goes up, uh, that's going to create all kinds of havoc in the, the uh, debt world, uh, and especially in the, our government's ability to uh, service its debt. So, um, it's, you know, it, 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 I think it's getting to be a, bit, a little rocky out there. Nobody has any confidence in the people who are running the government because the, the head of the government seems to be uh, some kind of a revenant or hologram or cigar store Indian. Uh, and nobody really knows who's in charge. We have some, you know, suspicions about who's in charge. And uh, they're about to spend uh, almost $2 trillion and that's going to go flooding the system. And no, you know, the whole thing is just so sketchy. Oh, and, and there's another $2 trillion on the way. But Yeah, the infrastructure spend for shovel-ready yeah. projects. And that's another yeah. thing that is going to be very amusing because... You know, part of the whole dynamic of uh, hyper complexity was uh, articulated very well by Joseph Tainter in his famous and seminal book, The Collapse of, Co of Complex Societies. And, uh, you know, one of the main ideas in that is that uh, you, you make over investments in uh, a complexity with diminishing returns. So what we're going to do with the the uh, infrastructure bill, I'm sure, is go out and uh, uh, really uh, spruce up all the interstate highways and maybe build some new ones at exactly the time that that mass motoring is kind of teetering on the edge of its twilight, you know, because, you know, there, there's also that, uh, there's that expectation that we're just going to move all these internal combustion engine, uh, uh, the whole fleet of cars into electric uh, cars. And uh, yeah. 
Yeah. That ain't going to happen. There are all kinds of secret hidden time bombs in this system. One of them that I don't think people are recognizing, at least the conventional economists, is, you know, the motoring system is failing now, not because of how you power the car, whether it's gasoline or electricity. It's failing because the middle class is being destroyed and there are fewer and fewer uh, credit worthy borrowers who can buy cars the way Americans are used to buying cars on installment loans. And I think what we're going to see in the next 24 months is uh, a, the, a tremendous destruction of capital, since so much of it is hallucinated capital. And then there will be scarcer capital for a smaller pool of people who are capable of borrowing money to buy cars the way Americans are used to. And hence, there will be few, fewer car sale, uh, sales. And if you can imagine a giant corporation like Ford or General Motors, um, you know, they need to sell X millions of cars a year to keep that business going. They can't sell 700,000 cars. They got to sell 6 million cars. You know what I'm saying? So their business model then fails. So you can see these uh, uh, links of hyper complexity getting each other, getting, getting each system and subsystem into terrible trouble very easily in sneaky and ways. And, and it's interesting that, you know, I've been a car guy my whole life. Always yeah, have, who doesn't like cars? Always had high performance cars and that. But, but now I notice that uh, we've entered the era. This, this always happens at peaks. Things always look best just before they collapse. Like we built the biggest battleships just before the battleship became a complete piece of junk. And the same thing is happening with, with cars of, of 600, 800, 1,000 horsepower. You know, they're going to be like the Duesenbergs in the 30s, winding up sitting in garages with dead batteries and birds roosting. They're going to be like the Baluchitherium of the Asian steppes, uh, you know, because you see this in evolutionary biology, too. Oftentimes, uh, animals uh, achieve their greatest uh, size and, and uh, you know, just before they go extinct. That's right. I mean, the T-Rex the and, uh, and its prey, which were a proportionally large size, were yeah. at the very end of the Cretaceous. Although yeah. that was kind of accidental with the with with the uh, meteorite strike, but yeah, it does seem to work out that way. Like the U.S. government is becoming even more giant and bloated and and unwieldy and incompetent and ineffectual, yeah. and and you know you're seeing the same thing in commerce in America, where you know commerce has all been uh, concentrated in these giant uh, Cretaceous giant. Uh, or organisms like Walmart and Target and Amazon. You know, those are the three big hulking land mammals of our time in commerce. And uh, you can very easily see them going extinct when their supply so who, lines start who, to fray. Do you have an opinion on who are gonna be the uh, little mammals that will take over from these giant, di giant dying dinosaurs? Well, I'm convinced as far as uh, you know, commerce goes, it's, we're going back to uh, Main Street and small business, you know, and whoever, when these commercial giants fail, and I believe that they will, uh, uh, you know, societies are self-organizing and emergent in nature. And they, they re-self-organize in relation to the circumstances that reality is sending down to them. And so, uh, you know, I think that, uh, 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 many, many, you know, millions of people will discover that there are opportunities to occupy commercial uh, and productive niches in an economy once these gigantic hulking uh, organisms go away or, you know, when their business models fail. And, uh, you know, so I'm expecting that the next mall is going to be Main Street. I, I also tend to recommend to people that uh, they consider moving, if they're going to move anywhere, if they're, if they're nervous about where they are, that they consider finding a good small town in, in America, a sturdy small town uh, near uh, somewhere near the inland waterway system, which is vast and includes the Ohio, Mississippi, 
uh, Missouri, the Great Lakes, the Hudson River Estuary, the Champlain Canal, and the Erie Canal. There are tens of thousands of small towns along these places, especially places that are meaningfully situated near agriculture that are going to probably um, be more favorable places than others, uh, namely the big cities and the suburbs. You know, what we're seeing in, in New York City now is really uh, an incredibly sordid spectacle of failure. And uh, I, I'm pretty much convinced that it, it ain't going to get better. It's going to get a lot worse for places like New York City. New York City is an extreme example because, you know, it evolved in a way that it became overburdened with megastructures and skyscrapers. And now we've discovered almost overnight that all of Midtown Manhattan is now full of skyscrapers that were converted from assets to liabilities in less than a year. They don't produce enough revenue to run them anymore. They're running at you know, 9% occupancy now. Uh, they can't pay their taxes, so you know you can say goodbye to the New York City subway system. They could barely keep it running at the height of financialization when all the asset stripping in America was being poured into Manhattan and Brooklyn. You know, but now that uh, so many people have left, uh, especially middle class taxpayers or upper middle class taxpayers, and uh, now that the uh, office buildings are all empty, you know that they're, they're not going to have any uh, tax revenue in that city. And I don't know, uh, I don't see any way out of that conundrum for the moment. I mean, there will be an important uh, human settlement there. It has, you know, one of the best harbors in the Western Hemisphere and, uh, uh, you know, excellent reasons to exist. But uh, the New York of Doris Day and Rock Hudson is not coming back. Yeah, you know, uh, talking about New York, I love that movie <clears throat> with Kurt um, Russell. Uh, Goldie, Goldie, Goldie Hawn's. Uh, oh, Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell, yeah. Yeah, Snake Plissken. Escape from, <laughs> Escape from New York. And of course, everybody wonders if, if that could really happen. But it happened to, uh, it happened to Rome, which had yeah. fantastic buildings. And they, they just fell apart. Things things change yeah. just over a slower slower period because you know while they were quite complex you have to remember the romans were basically uh the flintstones you know they did everything by hand and uh you know with slave labor and stuff they didn't have uh, a whole lot of they didn't have any you know powered machines although they had some pretty good you know machines you could run with uh humans and animals uh but you know, that happened over several hundred years. I think that the problem for us is that our, our hyper complexities are so tied into artificial energy so sources that uh, it, it prob probably happened much more rapidly than, than the Roman thing did. Are you, that's the, you know, that's the way I think of it. Now, when we were talking uh, or by email a few days ago, yeah. uh, I was asking you about the fact because I see you as something of a Renaissance man because you <laughs> do things and <clears throat> kind of boots on the ground in many ways. And um, the fact that you're a painter, uh, and I was thinking about that. Uh, you normally paint kind of, um, well, you paint what you see, the things around upstate yeah. New York where you are, but you're familiar with that painter of the last century Oh God, I can't remember his name. Uh, who did a did four famous paintings called the called the um, oh God this the cycle of of, of oh Thomas Cole yeah Empire yeah the course of Empire by Thomas Cole he was a uh, uh, an Amer he was actually uh, originally British came over to America uh, in the eighteen twenties thirties or so. Uh, went to Italy for a while to train, came back to America, uh, and be became kind of the founder of the Hudson River painting uh, school, as it was called. And he did a lot of allegorical paintings, and one of them was called The Course of Empire, and it showed in five, I believe it was five panels, 
uh, enormous paintings. Uh, the progression from the Arcadian uh, near wilderness to, uh, you know, through the early parts of uh, building the Republic to the course, you know, the, the height of empire with the, the Roman Empire, the R Roman Emperor going uh, through the city uh, after a great victory, and then the desolation of uh, collapse. Well, you want to do something like that, but updated. I mean, most people perhaps don't relate to ancient Rome, but uh, <laughs> you know, you could step ahead with uh, the same thing for the U.S. I think it'd be great. Well, you know, that's that's a different kind of studio painting uh, than what I. I'm a sur le motif painter. I just get out there in the landscape. I, but I'm but I am very interested in the contrast between the human imprint on the landscape and the natural stuff that you know, is all around it. And I, I do happen to live in a very beautiful corner of upstate New York with interesting topography. And so, you know, I come upon all this earth moving equipment or, you know, logging operations or the, the there are a lot of industrial ruins where I am because uh, we have several small rivers going into the Hudson and the small rivers uh, have a lot of topography involved. So there's a lot of waterfalls where they established early factories in the 19th century. And so the landscape is full of the ruins of these things. You know, a few years ago, I, I was in southern France uh, near uh, Nîmes, and uh, I was at a swimming hole uh, on the Gard River where the, the bridge, uh, the aqueduct from the Roman Empire goes across the river. And it's this massive thing. I mean, it's this is lar as large as any of the great bridges that we've built in our time. Maybe not the, you know, the Golden Gate, but it's really large, big, gigantic stone thing. People are still walking across that thing 2,000 years later, you know? Uh, it's not working as an aqueduct anymore, but it still works as a bridge. And um, we have stuff in my part of the country that's only 150 years old, and it's completely kaput. You know, the old railroad trestles are falling apart. There's no bridge over them anymore. Those things were built in 1850 and they're gone. And the stuff that the Romans built uh, in, you know, uh, 160 AD, you know, that stuff is still being used. So, so uh, it makes for a lot of interesting subject matter where I am and, and uh, a contemplation of how things kind of fall apart. Are you surprised that the um, <clears throat> that with all the COVID stuff and all the disruption to, to global trade that that all of that didn't actually manifest in uh, the system falling apart yet? I mean that 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 uh, you know the supply the supply chains has seemed to be resilient enough despite their complexity to make it through this at least last very difficult year where they were under a lot of stress. Are you surprised that it didn't break yet? No, no, not particularly, um, because just simply because of the inertia in the system uh, and the momentum uh, associated with that. Now, I, that, I'm not terribly surprised by that. What I think is most interesting, though, uh, is how we're, you know, we're, we're, we're just keeping the thing, the, the momentum going with, uh, uh, but by creating money that doesn't exist. And it's, uh, it's a pretty uh, temporary fix for what we got. And, uh, you know, sooner or later that is gonna have consequences. The, you know, the, the kind of the main uh, issue for, for us these days is living in a society where anything goes and nothing matters and there's no consequences for anything. And that's, uh, you know, that, that's one I think of the terrible uh, repercussions of all the political uh, uh, chicanery that's gone on in the last four years while Trump was president was that so many dastardly things happened and absolutely nobody had to answer for anything. And, you know, that I think that uh, behavior and uh, that that uh, way of operating in the world has kind of spread over spread through the whole culture. So there are no consequences for anything you do. The money guys can do whatever they want. You know, Congress can pass as many spending bills as they want and doesn't seem to affect anything just because it hasn't to date. But well, what do you, you know, think is gonna what do you think is gonna happen though with the fact that half of the country or more 
voted for Trump, and now they've got we've got actual Bolsheviks that are ruining the ruling. Uh, I almost said ruining, but that's true too. The country. So, do you think that the average kind of salt of the earth middle class guy that makes stuff and does stuff, uh, what's how's he going to feel about what's going on here? Are we looking at a revolution? or something like that, a civil well, war? Well, what interests me, uh, what I find so fascinating is that it's bad enough that we've got this you know, crypto socialist regime in place. But then on top of that, you have uh, at the head, you have this leader that nobody believes is really running things. And uh, you know, th that involves a whole national game of pretend that's like the emperor's new clothes. Everybody's pretending that Joe Biden is capable of being president. And then on top of that, you have this other whole thing, which is the culture war that the left is waging against normal people in this country. And I think that they are now getting to the point where they're so insulted uh, and offended by uh, you know, things like uh, critical race theory being taking over the public school system. And you're beginning to see revolts against that at just at a, a very civil grassroots, you know, school board level and PTA level. But, you know, that that stuff is going to start percolating up pretty soon. I, I think that, you know, half more than half the country is supremely pissed off about what's going on. Uh, the likelihood that we're going to see a resumption of uh, riots and looting and a lot of misbehavior of the type we saw last year you know, that's pretty good, uh, pr a pretty good chance we're going to see that resume. And uh, I think that's going to really kick off a lot of serious conflict in this country. I don't think people want to uh, want to see that anymore. Yeah, I'd have to agree. And the catalyst to set it off could be a collapsing stock market, which is going to happen at some point. And, could be the yeah. Derek Chauvin trial in Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's which starts uh, on the I think the, they're doing jury selection now. The trial starts on the 29th. Uh, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, you know, whether it jibes with your ideology or not, the fact is, or the facts are, that the guy, uh, this police officer who uh, kneeled on uh, George Floyd's neck, uh, has a pretty good case that he's, you know, could get him off of uh, all the charges. He does, of course. Of course, the estate of uh, George Floyd, which didn't exist before he died because he had yeah. negative assets, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, it's quite a score, $27 million. Yeah, quite a payday. Before, before we have even determined what the hell happened. It's yeah. incredible, actually. And they, the attorney for that family, Ben Crump, has been going around to every, you know, uh, every, every black guy who got shot in one way or another uh, by the police over the last several years and has been collecting these massive uh, civil suit payoffs. So he's, he's living pretty large too. But, uh, you know, that sends a ridiculous message, which is that, uh, you know, the city is going to settle a, se uh, a civil suit for a wrongful death before a jury uh, has adjudicated whether the death was wrongful or not. Uh, so that's, uh, queering the whole jury selection process now. Um, my guess is that, uh, uh, you know, they'll certainly have a case for a change of venue. And if they don't do that, uh, you know, I, th this case could get thrown out by an appeal, appeals court. It could be summar summarily thrown out by the judge uh, for the present trial itself. Um, I, I really see the thing as being deeply problematic. But you know it will it will most likely lead to a lot of turmoil and and uh, mischief in the streets. Yeah, I I, I agree, and of course <clears throat> I'm not a fan of the police either. I mean there are too many guys that go into the co police that have an extra Y chromosome, and they use their power inappropriately. But of course it's tempting because they're dealing with a you know, a whole bunch of career criminals like George Floyd was. So it's, um, you yeah, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I've been stopped by the cops for, you know, routine traffic stops and, and they were often very surly to me, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm just some white guy, uh, elderly white guy behind the wheel, but, uh, you know, uh, ima imagine how, what it might, might feel for them 
what it might be like for them to be dealing with, uh, you know, guys who are actually fighting them, trying to grab their guns, uh, you know, attacking them, uh, resisting arrest, uh, you know, punching them. I mean, that's a whole other level. So I don't know. Uh, you know, the, yeah, the, the policing is obviously a problematical line of work, but, uh, you know, what do you do without police? And, you know, are you going to send in social workers for, for these things? I don't think so. So. Of course, my answer has always been that policing is too important to be left to the government and the kind of people that generally become government employees. I would much rather have a Mike Hammer or a Mannix PI or a, a Sam Spade uh, chasing after miscreants than a flat. Well, I, you know, like it or not, public safety is a, is like one of the two or three major reasons for having government in the first place. So we're probably not going to privatize that. No, probably not. But it's it, it just seems to me perverse that. The three things that are most important in a society, protecting you from criminals outside the borders, criminals within the borders, and adjudicating <clears throat> disputes without uh, be between people are, is left to the government. I mean, they're the legitimate things because it's government is force, it protects you from force, that's legitimate. But those things are too important to be left to the kind of people. Yeah, but you know people. what we used to leave it to? We used to leave it to a social contract and a firm consensus about what constitutes decent behavior. And if you, right. let, if you let a large demographic in your country go ape shit and riot all summer and nobody gets arrested for it, you know, that sends a, a signal that we have a broken consensus about what decent behavior is. And, you know, that's you know, that's a cultural problem and uh, we can blame ourselves or, or blame woke America for, for doing that, for, for allowing I don't that think, to happen. I don't think there's any way out of it at this point, Jim. I mean, uh, you know, what's gonna turn things around? I, I think there's really got to be a, hate to use this word, but reset at some point. That's just well, gonna there's happen. gonna be a reset. It's just, it's probably not gonna be the Klaus Schwab version. I certainly it's, gonna, it's going to be a version that happens organically and emergently. And, uh, you know, it might involve something like, you know, it's not because Klaus Schwab decides that uh, we're going to have cryptocurrency. It's just going to be that the, uh, the dollar fails and, and uh, you know, we have to make some other arrangement. And uh, I, personally, I don't think uh, we're going to have national cryptocurrencies. I, I think they're too problematical. And the too many people... Uh, do not want to have their financial transactions um, tracked. Uh, at, at, you know, by, they don't want everything they do tracked, and they're they're not going to be in favor of that. So I think that that would provoke some kind of a revolt among normal people. And um, so this emergent uh, reset uh, is going to uh, baffle people. I think what it will constitute is pretty simple. Uh, the reset will be a recognition that we have to downscale just about all of the activities in our society. We got to make them smaller, finer, more local, shorter supply chains. Uh, we got to produce some things of value again. How we're going to do that, uh, I'm not sure. I think it'll be at a much smaller scale than 1950. You know, it, it may involve water power uh, as much or more than other things. Um, but, you know, I think it is going to be a, a, a much uh, a lower pitch of activity than we've seen. So, uh, well, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of upsides to that. One is, if we do find ourselves in that situation, there will, there will be a lot more occupational niches for people, including laborers, you know, people who for one reason or another, really don't have a whole lot more to offer than their labor. Uh, and there are a lot of those people in America who are now just kicking back and getting government money. And in the future, when there's a government that simply can't disburse money that is worth anything, I mean, you could, you know, you could give people a lot of money that's worthless, but that's not gonna help them buy their food, right? That, that those two ways of going broke, you can either have no money or you can have plenty of money that's worthless. Yeah. So, uh, 
you know, what are those people going to do? I, I firmly believe this, and it's going to sound maybe a little cracked that a lot of those people, uh, the ones that survive, are going to end up working in agriculture in one way or another, in food production, you know, at, at the uh, many, many layers of it from labor to management to ownership. And uh, you know, I, I respect the fact that you actually keep a garden and <laughs> know how to make a garden work properly at this point. I mean, that's become a lost skill, hasn't it? I mean, among most. Oh, Americans. well, not where I am. There are plenty of people who know how to do that. But I, you know, I'm in a rural county in upstate New York. But, uh, you know, the people who are living in uh, uh, condos in Hoboken are probably don't know a whole lot about it. It's not that hard to learn, uh, but it has a lot to do with whether you can even acquire a patch of land to do it on. And, uh, you know, we face this tremendous problem of uh, how are we going to demographically uh, rearrange the way we inhabit the landscape in this country? The suburbs are going to fail. They're, they're, they were, you know, their failure is built in, right? It, it seemed like a good idea at the time to build suburban America you know, for various kind of simple reasons. We had the world's largest uh, oil industry and a great supply of oil. And we had this giant continent that was not that heavily populated with a lot of cheap land, especially outside the city. So we built the suburbs. Seemed like a good idea at the time, but now they're going to fail. You know, we're not going to have the energy necessary to uh, keep the mojo of suburbia going. And uh, one of the great tragedies of the moment is that so many of the people who fled New York City, for example, moved to the surrounding suburbs. And that was sort of a frying pan into the fire situation. And I don't think that they're, they've reckoned, you know, what a bad decision that's going to turn out to be. What so, is it fundamentally about suburbs that make it, that make it uh, you know, in the fire? from the frying pan, because it would seem like these urban, like New York City would be more dangerous. They don't produce anything, you know, that everything has to be brought into them. It would seem like suburbs wouldn't be quite as bad as that, but why, why do you think it's worse? Well, uh, mainly because they're absolutely uh, car dependent. And uh, if there's any, free, you know, you don't have to like have no cars or no, no gasoline to uh, uh, wreck that business model. All you have to have is, uh, unpredictable supplies of, of gasoline and people unable to buy cars or car companies that are unable anymore to manufacture them because their business model fails. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, once that happens, the suburbs are really toast. The, uh, I think you are correct in, in, in one sense that there are, you know, not all suburbs are exactly the same and, and, and also not all cities are the same. New York City, for example, is an especially extreme example of a city overburdened with megastructures that are now obsolete, okay, that are now liabilities. But, uh, you know, uh, um, there are a lot of cities that are not composed of that much giant uh, stuff. And there are some suburbs that, um, you know, may be more favorably geographically located, you know, on, on waterways, uh, for example. You know, we're going to have to move a lot more stuff in America on, on waterways uh, or railroads. But, uh, you know, we haven't really faced up to that decision. And, and the, the door may be closing on that. Uh, we, should have begin, we should have begun rebuilding the conventional railroad system 20 or 30 years ago. And we could have built some high-speed rail lines at that time uh, when there was a lot of capital loose in the world. But now that capital is growing sketchy before it disappears entirely, we don't have the, the financial mojo to build high-speed rail. Uh, high-speed rail has tremendous uh, uh, impediments. Y you have to create whole new rights of way because these uh, high-speed trains require different uh, curve ratios and different grades, and uh, you can't necessarily run them along the old lines. But you know, America would be, uh, Americans would be delighted if they could get from uh, New York City to Chicago on time at 100 miles an hour. And that was the state of the art in 1923. Wow. Uh, and, you know, we could do that again. The infrastructure is sitting there waiting to be fixed. But um, so 
you know, the suburbs uh, present a tremendous conundrum for us, and they probably, for the most part, have three destinies, ruins, salvage, and slums, not necessarily in that order. And, and that, you know, that's pretty much how that's going to go. So, well, I mean, in, in your book, uh, A World Made by Hand, I mean, that there was, there was uh, one group that basically spent their entire days essentially on these salvage crews that were going into whatever areas, but suburbs, I assume, was a big part of it, and just pulling out any of the usable pieces and carting them back to, uh, you know, their dump or whatever, where, um, where they could be reconditioned and sold. And yeah. yeah, because, you know, most of the fabricated and modular materials that we depend on are no longer around, you know, sheetrock screws or, you know, uh, dimensional lumber, you, you name it. What do you think about what I mean, a big part of one of my views about, uh, you know, as, as, as the world has gotten more risky is just to move myself further away from people because I feel like people are the greatest risk to me. Now, I've now not, not all people, but I mean, we've seen examples where people are, you know, I just think of like uh, during the cultural revolution, uh, during the Bolshevik revolution, it was, it was your, it was the people around you that actually caused you much greater difficulty in that highly charged political situation than, than did maybe economics or other things. So, um, but I, I get from all my reading of your work that you see that as a huge mistake, isolating yourself from people and community is like a, it's almost like a suicide pact in a way. Like you're going well, to Well, ultimately we're gonna we're gonna need to depend on the people around us in our locality to rebuild fine grain networks of uh, you know social and economic interdependence. And that's what we used to have in a town, you know. I moved to a small town of twenty five hundred uh, a few years ago from uh, Saratoga Springs, New York, which was a town of twenty nine thousand and uh, much bigger. But I moved out here 15 miles away. And uh, the, the, I'd say the community is pretty completely broken. It, it really has no local economy anymore. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there, it's gonna take a lot to just repair the community ties in the little locality that I'm in. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we do have assets that uh, are going to have a lot of value in the future. Like we have these small rivers that are capable of producing local hydroelectric, you know, assuming you can get even get things like copper wire, you know, uh, to construct the turbines. Um, as for the community itself, pretty broken at the moment. Um, we probably will need an influx of younger people because these rural counties are getting pretty geriatric. Uh, I can see younger people making a decision to flee the suburbs and the cities um, in larger numbers. It hasn't happened yet around here. Um, and we really need new blood. And once that happens, I think, you know, there'll be a, a lot of different um, forces that allow the community to cohere locally. There's also a theory that I like. <clears throat> it came from the economic writer, Nicole Foss, who used to be associated with the, the, econo the Automatic Earth website. She, she since uh, moved on to uh, some kind of a, uh, you know, utopian small community in New Zealand, and she hasn't been writing much lately, but she had this idea called the, the um, trust horizon. And uh, what that meant was that as your society gets into trouble, the um, uh, confidence that you uh, invest in the authorities shrinks closer and closer to you. And the things that are farther away are now beyond the trust horizon. And you can see that happening now with the federal government becoming uh, increasingly overblown and ineffectual and inept and unable to really address or even start a conversation about the real problems in this country. And uh, I think it's, that is increasingly true of the state governments too. So how that is going to you know, reform and coalesce around localities is a big question. Uh, the one thing that we generally tend to leave out is the amount of or, uh, disorder that is entailed in that process. 
because you know it is a process of uh, really entropy at its basic level, uh, and um, entropy is uh, largely characterized by disorder. So you know what kind of disorder do we have to get through to the point where we can recohere and look around us and see what our assets are and see how we can rebuild a, a human society. <clears throat> what do you make? What do you make, Jim, of the? Uh the fact that the U.S. seems to have separated into the kind of people that live in blue counties and the kind of people that live in red counties, and they seem to hate each other. They can't talk to each other at all, and uh, they'll snitch on each other when, uh, well, especially the people that believe, you know, if you're not wearing your mask, you'll be shamed, or maybe they'll even call the cops on you. This has happened. So, uh, this seems to be accelerating this uh, break uh, breakdown into two or more groups. Well, I think there are a number of strange psychological dynamics behind it. You know, th there's the racial component of it, of course, you know, with uh, the famous, you know, white liberal uh, virtue signaling and, and uh, uh, militating against their own white race and, you know, behaviors like that. And that, I believe, really comes from uh, uh, shame and disappointment over the failures uh, uh, or inadequacies of the civil rights movement of the last 50 years. You know, it did not produce a utopia. And uh, I think uh, white liberals are deeply disappointed uh, and shamed in ways that they really can't even articulate it. So instead, they act out this kind of hysterical penitence routine, uh, which, you know, ends up just being another, you know, uh, historic social hysteria uh, up there with, you know, the, <clears throat> the Salem witch hysteria and the Jacobin phase of the French Revolution and, you know, other uh, historic uh, instances of bad behavior. Um, on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, they look at the uh, half the country of formerly working class deplorable so-called you know and they see this failing class of people who have lost the entire armature of their daily life and uh you know everything that would hold their their lives together economically and uh i think they uh, there's no other they, they can't account for it with their own behavior because their own behavior has been uh, to asset strip <laughs> that part of america you know they basically robbed that that whole demographic. And, and so they express their, their own shame about that as, uh, you know, objurgation against the deplorables. And, uh, you know, it has this, it has all the, these weird, uh, you know, sexual overtones, uh, you know, the, the, this ridiculous focus on transgenderism. And uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, the idea that uh, we shouldn't have boundaries in any behavior. You know, and uh, the, the, the left, and, and by the way, you know, I'm an old uh, registered Democrat, you know, I registered in 72 when George McGovern was running. So I'm an old Dem, but I'm no longer associated with that faction. And um, one of their main campaigns over the last uh, 40 years has been to erase boundaries of everything, you know, sexual categories, behavioral categories, everything. And um, we need boundaries in order to uh, even uh, ascertain what, what decent behavior is. So, uh, you know, what I call this, uh, you know, woke democratic uh, political faction is doing tremendous damage to our culture and maybe even fatal damage. And uh, I'm waiting for some kind of a robust counter revolution, which I think there will be. You know, I think it'll be like the Jacobin phase of uh, the French Revolution where the Jacobins came in and tried to institute all these insane new cultural changes like a 10 day week instead of a seven day week. And, you know, they changed the calendar and they changed all, you know, they got rid of the church and they did all these things that uh, really annoyed and insulted the, the common people. And, and then they killed 18,000 people in the process in the guillotine. And that's where, you know, the disorder, the entropic disorder expressed itself. And then after about uh, a year of that, they just up and got rid of him. They executed uh, Robespierre and his, 
his uh, colleagues. And that was the last you heard of the Jacobins. They were gone and their whole program with it. That's true. That's quite accurate. But it was really Napoleon was the next thing after that. Yeah, he was a different kind of thing, though. You know, what happened was, uh, as you know, actually it jibes with the situation we're in right now, which is we are absolutely leaderless. And, uh, you know, at the end of uh, uh, about 10 years, uh, eight or 10 years of the French Revolution, uh, the revolution had exhausted itself, killed most of the, the, its leaders one by one, and they were left in a vacuum of leadership, just as we are. And so what happens is this young, charismatic, 26-year-old artillery officer comes along, uh, you know, he goes out into the street with a couple of uh, cannons and demonstrates that if you uh, put the fear of God in the mob with a, a whiff of grape shot, that, uh, you, you know, you don't have, a, have to deal with a mob anymore. And everybody turns to this 26-year-old artillery officer and they say, he's the man. He's the guy. You know, and then he goes off and have, wins a few battles in some other places and he comes back to Paris and they make him the guy. And that's Napoleon. Couldn't that yeah. happen in the U.S.? Because the only institution that Americans kind of universally trust is is the uh, military. Which, yeah. Which well, I don't know if it would be a military thing. Although I could imagine at some point, I can I can actually imagine the military having to intervene in in our disorders one way or another. So I don't know that if that guy comes from there, I don't know if that guy comes at all. I mean, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes, you know, but doesn't repeat. But uh, look at the, the current leadership is utterly geriatric right now. And these people are gonna be, you know, walking off stage in the next five or 10 years, all the Pelosi's and, and Biden's and Schumer's, et cetera. You know, they're going to be gone and they're, they're going to be younger people coming along, many of them very capable and many of them uh, uh, very uh, competent at, at understanding what has happened to us and how to fix it. And um, I'm not sure that it will express itself as a, you know, the, the coming back together of the, the Republic of the United States as it was constituted. But, you know, they'll be running some things and, they, and some of them will be doing it well. Well, it, it just seems to me that in the Democratic Party, which may break up and cease to exist, but the people <clears> that <throat> kind of run that show are people like AOC and I think his name is Swalwell. And they, oh, my God. People. I know they're awful people, but they're still terrible. they have all the, the PR and this type of thing. And I don't know who the Republican... Yeah, but they're the Jacobins, Doug. You know, they're the Jacobins. They're, they're, they're the ones that are going to get shoved off stage pretty easily, I think. I don't think that they're going to be the, you know, I think that if, you know, when new leadership comes along in the USA, uh, it's, it's, it's not going to come from them. It's going to come from people we haven't heard from, people who are new faces, you know, people who are going to percolate up uh, in the years ahead. Yeah, I, of course. As an anarchist, I prefer not to see the leadership come from anybody that wants to be a politician or the political <laughs> class. But, you know, that's just a pipe dream on my part. I understand that. Yeah. Well, you know, we, none of us really know how this is going to work out. All we can do is spin out scenarios that appear to be plausible. And, and then, you know, the black swans fly in and the unknown unknowns uh, assert themselves and all of a sudden you're in a, a new place you never expected to be in. Yeah. I, I certainly never expected to. I never in my wildest imagination thought that the Democratic Party would come to represent a campaign against free speech. And yet here we are, you know, imagine that. I never imagined that the ACLU and that the Southern Poverty Leadership Council uh, would would uh, you know be one in favor of the most tyrannical behavior that you could imagine? But there they are. It's just astounding. You know we've turned ourselves inside out in ways that you and I never would have imagined in 1968. No, not not really. I mean, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin would uh, be up against the wall with the uh, the current leadership of the Democratic Party. Yeah. It's quite, yeah. quite amazing, actually. Well, yeah. I, still, I, 
I guess <clears throat> you're definitely the opinion though. I certainly am that this decade is going to be really rough and tumble and strange and surprising and kind of ugly. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the best thing that people can do is they can really put some thought and energy into figuring out where they might live and make a good choice and start thinking pretty hard about what kind of vocation they're going to follow and what kind of things they're gonna learn how to do so they can thrive. Notice, I'm not saying survive, so, so they can thrive. And um, building up networks of uh, you know, local inter interdependency <clears throat> so they can play both a social and economic role in their community. And for one thing, there are, there are going to be, there already are tremendous business opportunities for young people to start small Main Street businesses in America in anticipation of the failure of the failures of the big box system. And, uh, uh, you know, I expect uh, that young people will begin to recognize this and they'll start doing it. They did it in Brooklyn, actually, you know, over the last 10 years, and they did it pretty well. They did it. That was kind of an interesting demonstration uh, pr uh, project. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Brooklyn is part of Greater New York, and Greater New York faces some pretty um, uh, big difficulties in the years ahead. And, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, it's going to be the, a great place to live. So I hope they disperse uh, into other places in America as we kind of make new arrangements on the landscape about how we inhabit the terrain and where we go and what the assets are in various places. And uh, lots of opportunity for people to think about that hard. What are some of the examples of vocations or, or business opportunities that that are obvious to you that may not be to, to our listeners? Well, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, the inland waterways of America are going to become much more important again as we have to move more things on, on boats, uh, you know, especially more, more goods. Uh, so a lot of the towns and cities in those places, like, uh, you know, all along the Ohio River uh, and the Mississippi, you know, St. Louis, Ohio, uh, Cincinnati, uh, the smaller towns, they're going to be important. I think the Great Lakes, which have been a tremendously uh, d disinvested region, are going to become pretty important and attractive again. A place like Michigan, for example, has just tremendous agricultural assets. You know, you can grow anything there, fruit, grain, uh, trees, uh, you know, you name it. Um, plus, they have this tremendous inland sea that is like a freshwater Mediterranean. And uh, so there are going to be innumerable towns, I think, and, and, and cities that will become or remain more or less important. I think places like Chicago are probably going to contract simply because the scale of them is, is uh, wrong. But there, you know, there will be a reason for Chicago to be where it is. Detroit is in a very strategic location on a river between two great lakes. That's why it was there in the first place. And it will continue to be geographically important and strategic. Um, so I think the Great Lakes are hugely uh, undervalued. And, and not to mention just the, the available fresh water in the region. What about the skills uh, of people are like a younger people, people in their 20s, or, or watching this and thinking, you know, what skills are going to be important for the future? Yeah. Like, what, what Probably are, not gender studies. Probably not. Um, and, and, you know, then again, there are, there are regions of the country that you can look at, and they're, they're just quite obviously places with a pretty poor future, you know? You look at Tucson and Phoenix and, you know, West Texas, and uh, uh, those places, uh, you know, they can't, they, they don't have enough water. Uh, they, and if, if, if there, you know, if there is indeed going to be some kind of a climate, uh, reckoning, you know, there, it's probably going to be even worse for them. Um, I think people overvalue the Rocky mountain states, uh, because, you know, places like, um, Montana, 
Colorado. You know, they're pretty short growing season out there, not a whole lot of rainfall, pretty disconnected from the major waterways in America. You know, and, um, not a great bet, but, you know, maybe, maybe better than being in Atlanta. But uh, I'm in, I'm on the edge of New England. They say New England begins uh, on the east bank of the Hudson River. So I'm still in New York State, technically not New England, but you know, we've got some assets here. We've got some drawbacks. We, our agricultural land isn't that great. Uh, you know, it's hilly and stony, and, uh, but you can still grow a lot of stuff. We could certainly feed ourselves here if we had to. Uh, it's not that great for, for wheat because uh, we got a, a disease in the soil that, uh, called uh, wheat rust, stem rust, that has been here for hundreds of years came over with the Europeans and uh, makes it hard to grow wheat here. Um, so, uh, you know, Dixieland, I think, is going to be problematic. Uh, Dixieland became what it was in our time, really because of happy motoring and, and air conditioning for all. And if you don't have air conditioning for all, you got a real problem remaining civilized in, in, a, in places like Atlanta and Houston. And uh, that's going to be a difficulty. So I think that the, uh, the wet part of the Sun Belt down in the southeast there is going to revert to being an agricultural backwater after a while. And, uh, you know, we'll see how that works out. I don't know that any place in America is going to be, you know, a, a high tech powerhouse. And uh, we all ought to worry somewhat about the uh, survival of the electric grid. And that's, you know, they call it the biggest machine in the world. And uh, it's not in great shape. And I find it laughable that people never consider the fact that uh, the internet is entirely dependent on, on a dependable electric grid. Everybody thinks that the internet is a permanent installation in America and in, in a human condition. You know, if you subtract electricity, and you know, where's your internet? And by the way, where are your Bitcoins? Yeah, well, I'll say, but if you subtract electricity, it seems like the set of problems we have to deal with is so massive immediately. You bet. The least of your concerns would be your Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, you know, we got a lot of things to uh, worry about and to be concerned about. And so, you know, getting back to the bottom line for me is building local communities. Uh, we are starting from near zero in a lot of places like the town that I live in, uh, in flyover upstate New York. Uh, I mean, there, we're in a part of the country where, you know, you go around to some of the towns in the Mohawk Valley, in the upper Hudson Valley, you'd think you were in Kazakhstan or something. The desolation is just so enormous. And, uh, you know, we, we, we got a long a long way to go, but there's a lot here. And there, there's a lot still across America to uh, refashion a plausible national life around. Uh, what we don't have at the moment and what the Democratic Party is hell bent on destroying is a viable common culture composed of values that we can agree upon. And as long as they militate to keep destroying that, they're going to make it harder and harder for us to regroup and reset our, you know, to a new disposition of things. Well, hopefully it'll work out as it did to some degree in China where Mao will have, I think, historically turned out to have been just another of a very long line of stupid and corrupt emperors and Chinese <laughs> culture will survive as it has for thousands of years and hopefully American culture, what's left of it, will, you know, have a bit of a renaissance and come back. I'm not sure I want to plan my life around it just right now, but <laughs> you know, that's the optimistic outlook. And well, I, you know, I, history pulses. I always look at the bright side, like H yourself. H history pulses. You know, it expands and contracts and expands and contracts. His, you know, history and, and the human affairs are, are sort of like the way the whole universe works. And everything goes in cycles, everything pulses. And, you know, we, we tend to be pulsing down at the moment, but, you know, we'll, we'll have a repulse sometime in the future. And uh, what, what comes out of it will be a different country. Well, I want to make one final recommendation to everybody that's still listening. Uh, it's that... Uh, 
Jim ha publishes a fantastic free <laughs> blog twice a week. I always read it. It's entertaining. It's extremely humorous. I mean, it brightens my day. You've got a, a wicked wit that you express in that, in that blog. So I think everybody that's listening ought to subscribe to that. It's free. Yeah, it's I mean, free. I'm all you, you got to do is show up at kunstler.com, K-U-N-S-T-L-E-R.com on Mondays and Fridays at 10 o'clock Eastern time. I put it up without fail. I would also encourage people to buy your books. I mean, the ones that I have read so far is uh, A World Made by Hand. And I, I recently read Living in the Long Emergency. And you have one of the cool things about that book is that this, the second part of it, the middle section, you actually kind of do a deep dive with individuals who you've encountered over the years who are actually building a life to be able to flourish in the long emergency. And they're, very, they're totally different characters in totally different life circumstances, but they're all doing very, very interesting things. So I uh, definitely encourage people to, to take a look at, the, at that book as well. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having us or thanks for being here with us today, James. It was really awesome to have you. We, I know we have a lot of overlap between people who are fans of yours and people who watch our channel because when we mentioned it yesterday that you were going to be here, lots of people said in the comments, oh my God, James and Doug in the same room. <laughs> I'm glad we were able to do it. So thank you for being here. We're really a good thing we weren't drinking. We'll save that for next time. Yeah. Hopefully, and, and I'll bring us. I'll bring a cigar. And, oh, you know, excellent! It, it is interesting. One thing I'd like to do when I come back to the U.S. Uh, this summer, it's going to be a nuisance. Uh, international travel is a nightmare these days. But you know, I'm thinking maybe what I ought to do is drive up to upstate New York and see something I haven't seen for many, many years. Nothing like boots on the ground observation. You're welcome up here. We got plenty of room for you. Okay, I'll, I'll take advantage of that. Okay. You probably, don't, you, don't, you, you, you probably don't have any ritzy hotels in the area, so. Well, you know, Saratoga if, does, the, you know, 15 uh, miles away. There are plenty of ritzy hotels there, or semi ritzy I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to crash with you and camp out. If you can give me three hots and a cot, for a day. And we got a queen size day. bed. We got an extra queen size bed. <laughs> All right. And your own bathroom. Right, awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. We'll uh, wrap it up here and um, hopefully James will have you on again. Yeah, okay, Matt, it was great talking to you guys. All right, thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.